What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And this is going to be an amazing episode with a special panel about books and how they use books and the impact of books. Um, and I always like to mention, and I'll formally introduce everyone in a second, I always like to mention other episodes people should check out. Since this is book inspired, you know, I love books. Um, I'm here with Chris, Vanessa, and Lisa. And, you know, what I love about it is like, it's, 15 to $25 and you get someone's amazing life work, all their lessons in this small package that they, you know, had their blood, sweat and tears. They poured into it for really inexpensive. Um, and so uh, some of the ones that check out on the podcast, I had a uh, Perry Marshall. He wrote 80, 20 sales and marketing. He also wrote um, evolution 2.0, totally two totally different books. One's in sales and marketing. One's is does God exist? Okay. And uh, I've had never split the difference with Chris Voss, which is one of my favorite books I've learned a lot from and many more. So check out those episodes on Inspired Insider. And this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. In Rise 25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to do that over the past over decade to profile the people and the companies uh, with their thought leadership, shout out from the rooftops, what they're doing so everyone else can learn from them as well. So if you've thought about starting a podcast, you should, hands down. If you have questions, email us at rise25.com. Both my business partner and I, John, have been doing it for over a decade. So we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, I'm excited to introduce today's guest. Like you said, we're in for a special treat. If you're watching the video, you can see I have a panel of authors here talking about their book and the impact. And um, just to give you a little background of each one, um, Lisa Tenner is an award-winning book coach and specializes in helping experts, visionaries, and entrepreneurs write and publish compelling how-to self-help or business books. For over 12 years, Lisa served on the faculty of Harvard Medical School's Women in Healthcare Leadership and Publishing Courses, and her clients have signed five and six-figure publishing deals with Dozens of publishers, including Random House, Harper Collins, and more. You could check out check out her book, The Joy of Writing Journal: Spark Your Creativity in Eight Minutes a Day. She also teaches her Bring Your Book to Life program at LisaTenner.com/book. So check that out. And Vanessa Levin is the creator of Pre-K Pages, and it's one of the internet's most popular resource websites for teachers of young children. I can imagine. Vanessa, this has been really popular with the pandemic. Uh, everyone is is a teacher and homeschooling their kids at this point. So I don't care if you're a teacher or not, you should check out her website. And she has more than 20 years of classroom teaching experience. People everywhere follow her teachings and she has you know, more than a million people on social media following her. It's, it's pretty remarkable. Her book is Teach Smarter and you can check it out. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up the the web pages for each of these. You can check them out in a second. And uh, Christopher Littlefield is an international speaker. Uh, TEDx, you know, Chris, I was watching your talk on TEDx in uh, Beirut, um, of all places, and it was pretty remarkable. So people can check that out. And he specializes in employee appreciation, recognition, workplace culture, and the founder of Beyond Thank You. He's trained thousands of leaders on how to understand what their people want and need to be at their best. I even saw a video he did of someone on the subway, uh, or it was a train interviewing them. So he interviews people everywhere, asking about their experiences with their employers. Um, and some of his clients include Accenture, Boston Medical Center, Salesforce, the U S army and air force, the United nature you know, nations and more. He's the author of the bestselling book, 75 plus team building activities for remote teams. Uh, I'm going to stop talking, but thanks for joining me, all of you. And I want to start with the conversation. Um, I'm going to have you talk a little bit of just about your, your book and business and what you do. And I love, Vanessa, for you to start. And we'll also piggyback on, we were having a little conversation before we hit record on what Chris was commenting on. So Vanessa, why don't you start off a little bit about your business and, and what you do in your book? Sure. So um, I, at Pre-K Pages, started it when... 
I would say I was probably in my 11th year of teaching and it was about 2001 and I started a website and um, it was just for the parents of my students because that was what the district required us to do. And I wanted to get good marks on my um, evaluation as a teacher, right? (laughs) And teachers are people pleasers. So I started this website and um, big shocker here, uh, Jeremy, no parents ever visited it. (laughs) Uh, Because it's not not, a you build it and they will come situation usually, right? right? Well, it was just for the parents in my classroom, but Uh, But it started to get picked up on Google and uh, which was really amazing to me. The Internet was kind of in its infancy then. And I started getting people from all over the world finding it and asking me teaching questions, whether it was parents or teachers. And so I said, "Okay, well, I'm just going to roll with it. And so I turned it into um, a precursor to a blog, a teacher website And I just answered people's questions about teaching early childhood because it turns out that this was a huge gap um, that existed out there in the world. Uh, Information about teaching young children at that time was just not readily prevalent on the interwebs. So it just grew and grew and grew until finally in 2010, um, I had started offering a few products uh, for teachers to download, you know, like PDFs. And after a while, I was like, well, I think that maybe I'm making as much selling these as I am teaching. <laughs> like, is that even possible? Like, how did that happen? So um, I left the classroom and devoted myself full time to serving teachers um, and parents um, if they're interested and in spreading the word about early childhood education, best practices, and most importantly, in today's day and age, bridging the gap between what we think of traditionally as preschool and K-12 education. There's this big gap that exists between these two worlds, and they often clash. And so that's kind of where I come in to level the playing field and explain it to everyone. So that's how how, uh, Pre-K Pages started. And then you know, we can talk later if you want about how the book came to be. I mean, it's kind of like a eventual conclusion to the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, we'll um, we'll talk about the impact of the book and some of the things with the book. Um, and Chris, I want you to talk about your business and what you do in the book. But first, um, just comment on uh, what you were seeing with Vanessa, just to pick up on that conversation first. You were making a couple of comments on what you were seeing with, with her website. What I, what I just loved is, you know, as an entrepreneur, as an author, as a person who runs works and provides services and resource for other people. When I, when I got on Vanessa's website last night, knowing that we were going to be on this panel together today, I just got on there and I was like, wow, because as an entrepreneur, you see, you see a site and then you also see what they're doing on the back end and the amount of work and the creation and the way to have different things that you're selling or promoting on your site that support people as resources, but then also finding ways to monetize those those contributions in a way that bring people and you nurture relationship with them. And so when I saw that, I was just like, oh, wow, this is brilliant. And how it's organized, how it's laid out, and then thinking, wow, what an amazing resource people had over this last two years in a pandemic and even beforehand, because people are looking for things that they can do and looking for support and what's going to make their job easier. And that's what I see on Vanessa's site. Love it. So Chris, talk about your business and and what you do. And we'll talk in a little about the book too. Um, Well, what's really interesting, Jeremy, is I want to find out where you saw that interview, because that is a really old video that you found. And I don't even know where that was. I didn't even know that was still online somewhere. So you did dig deep. Um, My background is international conflict resolution. And I used to work facilitating dialogues between Israelis, Palestinians, Indians, Pakistanis, Greek and Turkish Cypriots. That's what I did, but you can't make any money doing that. Um, And then when I had a breakdown uh, with two of my conflict resolution partners um, and the thing that transformed that relationship when nothing else did was a simple recognition activity. And once that happened, I became obsessed with understanding the role of recognition in the workplace. And that interview that you saw was my initial research was interviewing people on the subway in Boston about the role of recognition in the workplace. And I did over 400 interviews. And the findings from that sparked my research on what is it that people want and need to feel valued in the workplace? How do we use recognition and appreciation to be able to do that? And recognition and appreciation as 
conflict prevention. And so I've spent the last 15 years helping managers understand what they need to do to build and maintain relationships. And so that was all of my work. And then when the pandemic hit, people were looking for resources. I had been working and living remotely for a decade. And so when I saw all of my speaking business disappear on employee appreciation, what I did is I shifted into, and I quickly wrote this book, 75 Team Activities Remote Teams, published in April 2020. And it has just been one, it has driven more business to me and all of my goals of my business is to provide resources that people can actually use to build and maintain relationships. Yeah. And we'll, we'll circle back with each of you and the impact of the book and how you use the book, because this will be instructive for anyone. And I see if you're looking at the site, I've, I've Chester uh, and I've had Dory Clark on the podcast too. So check out that episode. She's an amazing author as well. And so, um, you know, I want to go to um, you, Lisa, and talk a little bit about your business, what you do. Sure. I'm a book coach. And I would say at the time that I, uh, that I started to become a book coach, it was not sort of the, the huge business it is today. There weren't a lot of book coaches out there. And I, I kind of came to it a very circuitous way. I ran a nonprofit for 10 years. I'd gone to MIT. So really I had taken a lot of writing courses at MIT with amazing, um, amazing luminaries in the writing field. Uh, but, but, you know, it wasn't sort of a typical path for an MIT grad, I would say. And then I ran this nonprofit, was very burnt out and uh, started having a family. And I really wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I had had this idea for a book back at the nonprofit. And I actually talked my board of directors into doing a job share for the executive directorship for two years. I job shared, worked on my book uh, and, and also um, took care of my health. I had something going on with my health that kind of led to the inspiration for that first book, The Ultimate Guide to Transforming Anger, which I co eventually co-authored um, with a real expert in anger and a cartoonist. And um, and then, you know, I had my first child and I knew I couldn't continue doing the nonprofit work. And I really was questioning, you know, where do I go with this? I was in a yoga class and it was like this download of teach people what you taught yourself about writing a book and teach people the five steps to writing in a state of flow. So I just started with those five steps and I started doing these workshops at yoga studios and just local places. and and. What, what was amazing was that my people came to me and told me what they needed because I was teaching these five steps for creativity, but people kept coming to me for books and they wanted to know how to write a book proposal. They wanted to know how to write a book. And I had a big break when uh, my former publicist, Rusty Shelton said, you know, um, I was talking to Julie Silver, the director of Harvard Medical School's publishing course. And I asked her, uh, I, you know, she, she had invited him to, um, to speak. And he said, do you want me to ask her if she needs more people for the uh, writing workshops? And I said, sure. And uh, that was many years ago. And so um, they haven't had the course the past two years because of COVID. But for 12 years, I was on the faculty of that course. And hopefully it's coming back. It, it was an amazing experience. And I met so many literary agents who become good friends. And of course, are the agents are, that are my go-tos for many of my clients. And uh, so it's been an interesting journey because it wasn't exactly something I planned out, you know, and I've made business plans over the years, but ultimately I think the business found me and my clients found me. And it's, so that's been a really interesting way to do a business. You know, uh, Vanessa, I'm going to um, have you talk a little about how you've used the book and the impact of the book, but Lisa, first, um, what are some, when you think of just a few big mistakes people make in the process of writing and then putting it out there? What do you see? Yeah. So I'm going to preface this by everybody's got their own process and I'm going to tell you what works most of the time, but you really do have to listen within. And I have an exercise I call meet your muse. So we can ask your inner, inner knowing, you know, you'll go to your inner guidance for answers. But I would say that often a big mistake is just starting to write and having all these slips of paper 
And, and so I really have people go back and start with what's your vision? What do you want this book to do? And who are your people? Who is it for? And it may sound really simple. And of course, as business people, when we write a business plan, that's where we go. But a lot of times people, people skip some steps and I, I've had really experienced business people. Um, I had a, a um, executive recruiter at the C-level he was writing a book and he had three different book ideas. And only one of them was really the book that met his business goals. But he thought that was too simple. You know, it was everything he knew. And he was maybe, you know, thinking, oh, everybody knows this. I'm not sure. But he had all these other complicated ideas that really weren't going to move the business forward in the way he wanted. So, you know, it sounds simple, but it's like a mistake a lot of people make, mm. even really smart, experienced business owners. I love that. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to jump in. So one of the things, and so Vanessa and I actually are here and connected because I think we both participated in one of Lisa's courses. And just to piggyback on what she shared, you know, when the book that I published is not the book that I originally came to Lisa for, and I'm still working on that one. Um, but what I got out of it, it's funny because as Lisa was saying, the meet your muse and the activity and the guide that she has, I can still remember, and I was living in Chile at the time, getting Lisa's packet printing it out, sitting in a Starbucks for almost five hours straight, realizing, oh, I guess I should ask myself these questions first. And then literally getting a structure to take all of these thoughts that were spinning out. And I still remember having cards on the table in front of me of all the chapters of my book. And having that structure is what allowed me to actually move through the process and actually get something on the page where before it was just so overwhelming because it broke down the process. And then I was able, when I did decide to write the book that I wrote now, to literally look at this and be like, oh, okay, here's the structure. Why am I writing it? What's the purpose of it? What are the sections? How is it going to fit together? What's the organization? And that gave me the ability to pull the book that I did together, together in like two months. I love that. And also it's like what you said, Chris, and Lisa, what you said is sometimes we're so close it, to us, it seems simple, but it's a revelation for someone else, right? And so you know, like you said, with that executive, it, that's just what they do. So it seems easy. It seems simple, but someone else from the outside wouldn't think that. Um, Vanessa, what about you with the the process? Because um, I know you've done some work with Lisa as well. That was helpful. Right. Yeah, I think everything Chris was said, Chris said was applicable to me too, because um, I had no idea where to start. Like I had all these ideas in my head. And I did not know like how they were going to come out in the end. Right. I didn't have any structure um, and I didn't know the process. I was extremely unfamiliar with the publishing world. And I think um, that was super important when I worked with Lisa because she really explained how the publishing world worked to me. And it made so much more sense then because I was entering this unknown realm. All, all I had ever known was the inside of public schools. And so that was a completely foreign world to me. So she helped explain things, break it down. And then like Chris said, she had this structure that really helped me get the information out of my head because I had all this information in my head, but I didn't know what shape it was going to take. And so again, I spent just like um, Chris said, I spent time, you know, following her methods and um, she just, everything just made sense in the end. And I don't think I could have um, achieved what I did with the book without her expert help. So and if Vanessa, I could, you go if ahead. I could chime in. Um, so Vanessa had the pressure of a book deal. She had a book deal from Wiley and she had to get that book done in record time. And so when we're working under that kind of pressure too, we really can't afford to make mistakes. And so there it gets really important that you're writing the right book from the start. So we really get clear on that book concept and structure before you start writing. And I, I think that's just so key because it's so much easier to write and to uh, make sure what you're writing is something you're likely to use in the book if you've got that detailed structure to work from. I'd love to hear some comments from each of you on self-publishing versus not, right? Lisa, you're smiling because you probably get this question a lot. 
Well, that for sure. And you know, I'm speaking at a, a writer's conference uh, in a couple months on the topic, but also because I traditionally published my first book, a lot of my clients traditionally publish, and then a lot of them also self-publish. But I, um, I decided to self-publish my most recent book, The Joy of Writing Journal. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's been interesting because it's a huge education for me. And uh, I had only myself before that traditionally published. And there were things I didn't know. There were mistakes I made. Uh, but, but it is a really wonderful process, too, because you have all this control. I decided to do it because the book has these QR codes. And um, that was something I knew I wanted people to be able to, when they're journaling on this 30 day adventure, be able to take their phone, you know, and suddenly be watching a video where either I'm sharing some um, inspiring tips to the, for them, or um, my favorite videos are actually just where people are reacting to the prompt. Some of them are famous writers, New York Times bestsellers. Some of them are just young people just out of college a real mix of people responding to the prompts. It's really fun. And that kind of level of engagement, I didn't think a publisher was necessarily going to go for. And I felt an urgency to this book too. Like with COVID, people needed some way to, um, uh, needed ways to tap into their creativity, but also feel connected at the same time. And so I didn't want to wait. I knew that traditional publishing is going to take longer so I, I'm really glad I self-published this book and it's been really fun. And I'm also still recovering from some things I didn't know and try to figure out, okay, how do we deal with that? So it's been a real education too and humbling for someone who's an expert in, in book writing and uh, traditional publishing. I'm going to circle back to that in a bit, Lisa, because you mentioned QR codes, if there's other things people should be thinking of putting in their book that they haven't thought of before, but um, you know, so Vanessa, what about you, uh, self-publishing versus, versus not? So my first bu book, I self-published and that was, I think in 2010, don't look it up, please, Jeremy. It's terrible. <laughs> um, it's, you can't find it on my website. Um, it is. Oh, I'll find it. I found Chris in Beirut. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> So it was, um, it was very stressful for me to self-publish because not only was I responsible for creating the content, then I had to figure out how to format it. And then I had to figure out the self-publishing platform. And there were just a lot of unknowns and that really that whole process took me way longer than, than writing a book for a publisher because they do a lot of the heavy lifting. And so, um, my first book still sells and people still buy it, but I'm not proud of it <laughs> um, like I am of the professionally published one. Now, of course, 2010 was dinosaur years in the Internet time, you know, um, so things probably have changed a lot since then. And um, I don't think I regret writing either one of them. I think each of the um, different avenues has different things, different benefits and things to offer to the author. Chris, what about you? Um, yeah, and, and one thing is every time you pull my my site up compared to the other two, I'm like, oh my God, I need to update my website. Yeah. Um, so I, you know what, this, I will go with a traditional publisher for the book that I had planned to write originally. This was a quick pandemic pivot and I just had some resources. And so I had already written kind of a, a lead magnet with some team building activities. And then I thought, hey, could I pull this together? And then I used kind of the same structure that I had used with Lisa Pryor, pulled it all together. And this was self-published, but I self-published it, but I used it as a practice launch for a book I'll do later. So I, I self-published it, did it on Amazon, used a methodology from a guy I had seen uh, before about becoming a bestseller. I followed that strategy, mimicked it to the T, and then I used my network and the same launch strategies I'd seen from other people. And it just did very well. And it's like, and I, and I don't mind, like I look today and it's, I've already made uh, $21,000 in revenues in a year and a half, just on book royalties. Right. And so I launched it the same way and I got that momentum going. And so I did the video, I did everything else that I could to launch it, launched it, had a whole strategy around reviews and anything like that. And so it was very, it did very well. And it's, you know, it made me question, do I want to go with the traditional publisher in the future? Because I have less freedom. 
but it also has been just an amazing uh, additional stream of revenue and also an amazing way to bring people into my work because I have a list sign up in the book, have a lot of freedom over that um, to be able to decide what goes into it and what doesn't. Yeah. And, and I want to, that's the next topic I want to talk about, which is like, how have you used the book as far as um, in the impact on your business? So, you know, uh, Vanessa, I'm going to go to you in a second, but just to piggyback on what you said, Chris, talk about that, how you've used the book. Cause you mentioned lead magnet for anyone who doesn't know, you know, it's basically, you know, exchanging something that's very high value for someone for an email so that they, that person can actually communicate with you. So Talk about how you used it as far as the book as a lead magnet for your business and some of the other ways you've used it. Do, do you want me yeah, to? Yeah, Chris. Yeah, go. Yeah, keep. Yeah. So I have, you know, when I when I put this out there originally, so now it's got momentum. It's one of the best sellers in, in remote team building. I don't like the word team building, but I knew people would be searching for those resources. So that's why I named it that way. Um, so I... For me, the book has acted as a reason, and there's actually my lead magnet up on the screen, um, but I use this as a way, as it's a simple access point for people. So people are looking for resources right now, and then they find me through the book. And on page like two or three of the book, there's an opportunity to sign up and get free downloads that come with the book. Um, that would be on the other page, but um, you get free downloads for the book. And so I'm having two to three people sign up every single day who've purchased the book. Um, and it also, what's interesting is that I can tell when people are looking for it based on book sales. So I know in September, all of a sudden I get a whole ton of book sales and then I have list signups the next day. And then I have the same thing in January and Vanessa, I see you nodding your head. It may be the same. There's like certain times a year where all of a sudden people are looking for it. And then that, that also lets me know what content I need to publish on HBR or on Forbes. Um, then because I know what people are looking for. And so it's been great. And then I've also, I run a workshop uh, called Hybrid Leadership Playbook around the content of the book. And I did that probably 50 or 60 programs last year. And that was the biggest revenue generator I've ever had for my business as a speaker and a trainer. So people can get to know you, they can get the book and say, I really like this. I want more of Chris and then hire you for whatever else they need yeah, you for. Well, they, they, they read it and then they want their people to do it, but they know that if they, you know, and a lot of people will buy the books. I can tell because I'll, I'll sell 150 books in one day and I have given out to the business and then I'll get a whole bunch of signups. And then what they'll want is, okay, we bought them the books, but we don't know if people are going to read it. And so then we want to give them an experience to actually learn that. And then I end up coming in as a speaker for those companies. Love it. Vanessa, what about you? Uh, what, how have you used the book and what's been the impact on the business? Um, well, I use the book in a number of different ways. Um, the primary way is as a vehicle to lead to my membership site, because I believe that um, in my experience, teachers, you know, they want information, they want ideas, they want to learn, they want to be current in their knowledge. Um, and we can give them that. And, and I give them that in many, many, many different ways, whether that's on the blog or on my podcast or, you know, in the book, however they want to take that information. But the, what they really need help with, in my opinion, is um, putting all of that information and that knowledge and those ideas into practice. Um, because what it looks like in action is, is you know, a completely different thing. And that's what I found that teachers really need. Um, and so I started a membership site in 2016. And that has been really the driving vehicle in my business. Because now, I provide not just all these resources that you see on the screen that are, they're going to solve problems for teachers. They're going to help them do their jobs uh, and do them well. But um, what they really need is more training, support, and coaching in how to put all those things into action. And so that's what we used the book for was a vehicle um, to provide them with this much needed and requested and sought after knowledge, but also to let them know that if you need help putting all the pieces together, um, then the membership is the place to go because the topic of the book is early literacy. And anyone who's ever taught little children knows that that's such a huge and difficult thing to teach young children. And so um, the natural next step for readers of the book is to um, join the membership. 
Yeah, and if you're looking at the uh, video, you can see what Chris was talking about. The amazing breadth of resources she has here on her uh, page, uh, pre-kpages.com. I mean, you can see all of these amazing resources here for teachers or or families alike, right? Um, sure. uh -huh. Talk about the membership site for a second. Um, what have you found has worked? What have you found has not worked over the years? With the membership site oh goodness um i think what really works in my membership site is to uh, provide teachers with professional development training just like um, doctors or um, attorneys need to have continuing professional development credits to, to maintain their licenses teachers also need that same um, type of training and so um, i provide them with that but it's specific to the age group. And that's what teachers don't have in their jobs in their elementary schools, right? Um, Cause that's usually, I, I focus on um, pre-K or pre-kindergarten which is children ages four to five. And um, those teachers that are in those situations um, they go to a lot of professional development provided by their school district but very little if any actually is aimed at their age group that they work with. And so they're just completely left out in the cold, which is what Google told me back in 2001, right? That these teachers don't have anything. They're just told, oh, well, you'll, 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 it'll work. Just don't worry. Just fix it for pre-K, you know? And that's not actually, young children's brains don't work in that way. You can't just adapt down equation, you know, uh, fractions or <laughs> multiplication down to preschool um, easily. So uh, the video trainings have really, really um been a, a driving force in the membership. And in 2016, video uh, webinars and trainings and that kind of, kind of thing were not the norm, I would say, maybe. Um, they were kind of emerging. And of course, in 2020, we know <laughs> that they are the norm and they're not just the norm, they're the expected now. So we've had a lot of success with the video trainings and then also a community because teachers really lack community. They're they're in these four walls all day, every day with these little people. And there's very little interaction with other humans, especially with other teachers, because the other teachers are trapped in four walls with all their students. And so there's not a lot of opportunity for collaboration, um, bouncing ideas off each other, sharing insights. And so we have a community as well. So we have all the resources in our membership that teachers can take one off, use however they want. But if they really want to, um, hone their craft and they take the video trainings and they engage in the community. And that's what makes the whole thing uh, kind of come together. Yeah. And that's one thing that, it, that just occurred as you're talking. It's also teachers that are choosing to want to develop better. Yes. And I know that that's not what most teachers are always surrounded by. Uh, right. School districts. So they're also getting, they're also meeting people who are actively looking at being better teachers, which is really cool. Yes, and I think that um, every teacher out there um, could probably benefit from, from Chris, from you coming to their school district and helping out their administrators, because right now, teaching is not a happy, fun, uplifting place to be working, <laughs> so. I feel very appreciated. <laughs> I know, right? Amazing. <laughs> there you go, Chris. You have a new uh, line of business right here. There you go, exactly. <laughs> It's funny because when you're talking, Vanessa, it reminds me of why I bought the book. And, and Chris, I think you'll appreciate this. Never split the difference with Chris Voss is because, you know, people buy it for all sorts of reasons, business reasons, negotiation reasons. If people haven't heard of it, it's a, he's an ex FBI hostage negotiator. And I bought it because of my kids. Like it's sometimes I feel like it's dealing with, I'm not going to say little terrorists, but like they refuse to do certain things. Like, I'm not going to put this on. I'm not going to do this. I'm like, I need to read this book. It was for parenting is actually why I read Never Split the Difference. So, I, Chris, I know you like the conflict resolution side of you is like, um, that, that's, why, that's why I got it. Um, so talk, Chris, a little bit about how, um, you know, the impact um, as far as you, know, you were saying for, for Lisa, what are some things that I know you're doing a lot now? What is on the docket for the future of what you want to do? with the book or um, the business? For, for me or Lisa? Yeah, for you. Uh, well, I, I think for me is it right now I'm working on, on the next book, but I think what I'm doing now is building the platform to be able to launch that the way that I want. 
Um, and so right now, my book that I wrote is to keep that momentum going. I'm regularly writing articles in HBR and Forbes that link back to the book. Um, I send out a newsletter, uh, my newsletter, The Nudge, which I send out uh, every two weeks with resources that are always linked back to the book. And then that for me is a feeder into the greatest thing for me before is that in 2019, I did 120,000 miles going to speaking engagements. And I lived in Chile. You know, my wife used to work for the United Nations, and that's why we were down there. So I was flying back and forth. And the most amazing thing is that in the pandemic, we moved back to the U.S. and now live outside D.C., I didn't get, I got on a plane once last year for an event that was booked in 2019. So now I'm running the same programs for more than I used to charge beforehand and I don't fly. And that's absolutely amazing. I can do two programs in one day from this office and never leave. And so this area of remote team building, which is really just how do we build and maintain relationships regardless where we are, is going to be a stream of business for me in the future. But I also am now setting up for there will be a time where we'll transition back and to make sure that I'm a resource for people then about how do we nurture culture appreciation regardless of work in the office or working in a hybrid model. And so Lisa, I want to circle back with what you were saying with the QR codes and other things people can be doing with their book. And I was reviewing, um, I was looking at, I'm going to pull up in a second. Um, one of the the bullets on this page stuck out to me, which you talk about um, the secrets of compelling writing. Okay. So this is, if you're looking at it, it's at lisatenner.com slash book. This is <clears throat> Lisa's um, program. And I was just like looking through this, uh, this amazing page and investor, there you are right there. Um, so talk a little bit about that. Um, secrets to compelling writing. Sure. Uh, you know, I would say almost all the secrets to compelling writing that I learned, I learned when I was at MIT uh, in one particular seminar with Frank Conroy, who was at the time the director of the National Endowment for Arts and Literature. And the next year he went on to become the executive director of the famed Iowa Writers Workshop. And he was such an amazing teacher when it came to the craft of writing and particularly revision. And so, you know, one of the things he taught us was very visual. He said, you know, I had a professor who would just take the first three pages of anything you gave him and throw it in the garbage <laughs> because, you know, you, you always start with a lot of stuff that that's not really starting at the heart of it. And even though he didn't do that to us, which I was very grateful for, he did show us that visual and it's just remained in my mind. And so, you know, it's fine to sort of work yourself up to the beginning of the book. You know, often we need that for ourselves to get into it, but then really look at how compelling is that beginning? And it probably isn't as compelling as you think. So find those moments of real tension. And that that can be with a nonfiction, with a um uh, a more prescriptive book too. Most of the books I work on are some are usually prescriptive as opposed to like a memoir or completely narrative. And uh, but but you know you want to start with a really powerful story. That's what brings people in. Sometimes a very powerful statistic can do it too. So that's the beginnings. Um, I would say also you know we always hear show versus tell, but you know what does that mean? And it and it really means that. Trust your reader. You don't have to tell them the emotions. You don't have to tell them what to think, but but give them the clues that are going to really bring it to life. And so that's you know your sweaty palms when you're nervous, right? Or um, uh, you know some action, but but really bring things to life. And the other thing that really brings to life are your verbs. And when we talk, we often use passive verbs, and we use our voice, the tone of voice and the energy we give to our voice to give life to that. When we say, you know, he is amazing, you know, we're, we're giving energy to that is, but you don't have that on the page. On the page, it's your verbs and it's your very specific verbs. So he went, doesn't have a lot of energy and it doesn't really tell me what's going on. He went to the store, but he ran to the store, gives me a little more information and he sprinted to the store, really starts to paint a picture. So those verbs are going to be your best friends. And it doesn't mean you're going to do that in your first draft. Don't even worry about that stuff. The first draft is about getting on the page, getting into flow. But when you go back, 
really look for those verbs that are going to paint a picture. And every time you have a was or is or a had or has, just circle it and, and then see how you can change that, the, you know, the way you use the verbs. I'd love to get one tip from each of you on what's a must to include your book from like a marketing and business perspective. And at least since you were just talking, you mentioned QR codes, right? Mm -hmm. um, is, what are some other things that people can do uh, in their book? Yeah, well, certainly, I mean, stories are huge and important. Just telling people information is usually not that helpful. Uh, but, but the other thing I would say is... Um, I like to make a book experiential. So I like to give people exercises. I like to give them something they can do that can create transformation on the spot. So for me, that's a big one is experiential exercises. Mm. Vanessa, what about you? A must to include in someone's book to, for a business, uh, looking at it from the business perspective. For me, it was those personal stories. Um, I knew from the get-go that I really wanted to include them. I didn't really know how to craft a good personal uh, story. So that's what Lisa really helped me with there. But I know that um, as teachers, we often read a lot of professional development books that are just really their textbooks. That's just another nice way of saying it. And um, most of those do not use personal stories. And um, I had read one prior to signing my book deal that did in Everyone that I knew that read it said it was the best professional development book they ever read because the author used these personal stories. So I knew I wanted to do that. And uh, I just needed help on how to craft those, um, those stories to make them compelling because, you know, I would write one and it would be like very flat, but then I would uh, follow Lisa's formula and then it became, it, it came alive. And that's one thing that people tell me about Teach Smarter is they really appreciate the personal stories, they make the content seem much more accessible. Nice. Can I add a little something yeah, to that too? So with the personal stories, you know, it, it makes it much more readable, entertaining and enjoyable. It, we learn better from stories. And then there's also the aspect that right away, you're creating some social proof. You know, if you're telling a story about you're, you're using this technique or, or how this impacted you. That's, that's one area. And of course, include stories about your clients, because that's going to show uh, the difference that you can make for the reader as well. It's kind of what you're saying, show versus tell that story actually just shows people you don't have to kind of describe the process because you're describing it by telling the story. Um, Chris, what about you? I would say know your reader and what they're looking for when they're coming to get your book. Um, Cause mine was specifically remote team building activities. I cut out all the fluff. So there's very little reading. Somebody can get through the whole intro in maybe 15 minutes. And then here's how to choose the activities. And it was very specific. I remember asking one of my potential readers as I was writing the books, so it was going to be 101 ways. He's like, I don't want 101 ways. I want the five activities that I'm going to be able to use and how to decide which one's going to be the best right now. And I restructured the book after interviewing him because he was my ideal reader. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it was making it. And then also for a business side, make sure you're showing people that you're more than just an author. And so for mine, it's letting people know that I'm a speaker, letting them know that I have that resource and then giving a way for them to be able to connect early on in the book where they're going to sign up for my newsletter, or they're going to realize there's downloads that they can get, or they realize that there's videos that I, that I have on YouTube. So letting people know how to do that. And I think the last thing that I would say, the biggest mistake that I made is I launched a Kindle book before I had the print version ready. And I probably lost about $10,000 in sales because I did only one version when I could have, just because I didn't know, I launched a Kindle version and then I did the paperback version. And I would have had those two ones ready. And then the last thing I would say is just, people think that writing is the hardest part. Launching is the hardest part, right? Writing is the easy part. Launch, <laughs> having a team behind you to get it out there and continually get it out there once you've done it. Yeah. And I love what you said, Chris, about um, customer feedback. I mean, once you get customer feedback, you put in the hands of your ideal person, they're going to tell you exactly what they love and, and what may be missing. So I love that piece. Um, 
I want, I have one last question for each of you, which is along the lines of books. I want to hear some of your favorite books. Um, it could be business. It could be not. Um, before I ask it, I love for each of you to point people to where they can find out more about you and to learn more. Um, Lisa, I'll start with you. Where should people, where should we point people to go to learn more? Well, they can just come to the homepage, lisatenner.com. And that's a really good place to start. And, and there's a free course that that gets you writing your book. Um, and you mentioned bringing your book to life and that program's uh, on there under the, the write a book tab. Um, but that that is coming up soon. So people are really excited about writing a book. That's a good place to visit too. Um, and favorite books, I would say Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert is a real favorite. And it is about the creative process and the writing process. And she tells such extraordinary stories and tells them so well. Love it. Um, Vanessa, where should we point people towards? I know I have your website up here, but where should they check out? Uh, well, I think this page that you have up, um, pre-kpages.com, you can find just about everything there. Um, our membership isn't prominently featured because we really want to make sure we attract the ideal uh, person that we can serve. So it's kind of, it's layered within there, not prominently featured. Um, but that I think is the best place to go because you can find all my socials. My podcast is featured there at the top. The book is also in there. Um, so yeah. Right. And then what are a few of your favorite books? Um, I tend to read a lot. So I'm going to list one of my most recent favorites. And that was Hour of the Witch by Chris Bojalian. I really love his writing style and I, I currently live in Massachusetts. And so the whole Boston connection was fascinating to me. I don't read a lot of business books just because I'm a teacher and I find them boring. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Uh, Chris, what about you? Where should we point people yeah. towards? You can, you can find the book on Amazon, 75 Team Like Teams Promote Teams, and also my site, which is beyondthankyou.com. Um, and then my two, the books that I probably recommend the most, and I am in the business world, which would be Conscious Business by Fred Kaufman, which is a book I absolutely love. The first three chapters should be required reading. And then 15 Commitments of a Conscious Leader. And I am going to blank on the author's name, but I can see it over here on my shelf. Um, those are two of my favorite books, which are just really breaking down uh, leadership and being a conscious leader into kind of the simplest elements. And I absolutely love those books. Okay. Well, I want to be the first one to thank all of you for joining me on this uh, and sharing your knowledge with everyone. Everyone check out their websites, check out Inspired Insider, check out Rise 25. And uh, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Great talking with you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.